The Workers' Party's top leaders will be expressing their views on Parliament's Committee of Privileges report when the House debates the report next Tuesday. In a statement released today, the WP notes the recommendations by the committee to fine Ms. Reza Han and to refer WP leaders Mr. Pritam Singh and Mr. Faisal Manap to the public prosecutor for possible criminal charges with grave concern. It says the last time criminal charges were brought against an elected opposition MP relating to their political work was in the 1980s. It adds that Mr Singh and Mr Faisal will also cooperate with the public prosecutor and defend themselves in court in the event that charges are brought against them. The committee's report released yesterday was the culmination of the committee's probe into lies told by Ms Khan in Parliament in August and October last year. And the recommended penalty for her, $25,000 for the lie and $10,000 for repeating it. The committee also proposed for Mr Singh to be referred to the public prosecutor for further investigations with a view to consider criminal proceedings against him. It said it was satisfied that Mr Singh was untruthful in giving evidence under oath and that this may amount to perjury, a serious criminal offence. And for Mr Faisal, the committee deemed him to have played a subsidiary role. It called for Mr Faisal to be referred to the public prosecutor for further investigations due to his flagrant refusal to answer relevant questions put forth by the committee. The Straits Times' opinion editor Grace Ho has written a commentary headlined COP's final report on Raisa Khan is not the final chapter to a long-running saga and she joins me now to share more. Help us understand, Grace, the Privileges Committee was set up to look into a complaint against Ms Han, who had admitted to lying in Parliament. Now, after multiple hearings, special reports and video recordings, the final report uh, yesterday calls for actions to be taken not only against Ms Khan, but also WP's leaders, Pritam Singh and Faisal Manap. How did it come to this? That's a good question. Um, last November, most of us thought that once Ms Khan admitted to lying and she resigned, there was case closed. And it would have been the case had it not been for the Committee of Privileges hearings, where Ms Khan said she was directed by senior WP leaders to continue with her lie. Once she made that allegation, you know, it opened a can of worms and various red flags emerged. For example, the WP disciplinary panel that was announced in November it was formed entirely from the only three WP leaders who knew from as early as August what had happened. You know, people start to wonder you know, to what extent was Ms Khan doing everything of her own volition and what role was played by the WP leaders in the continuation of the lie. So things quickly got complicated from there and that affects everything downstream. The degree of Ms Khan's culpability relative to the leaders, the need to carefully consider what should be the penalty for all the parties involved. Why did the committee propose uh, that Ms Khan be fined $35,000 but call for further investigations into Mr Singh and Mr Faisal? Yeah, that's a question which has been asked especially by the WP supporters. Why this differentiated treatment? Is it unfair? But this isn't just a matter of someone arbitrarily deciding who gets more punishment than the other. There is a real distinction between the nature of Ms Khan's and Mr Singh and Mr Faisal's misconduct. But let's be clear here, no one is disputing that Ms Khan lied in Parliament. And that's serious. She breached parliamentary privilege. But this is not a criminal offence. Why? Because MPs are given immunity from prosecution and civil lawsuits for statements which they make in Parliament. She also subsequently admitted to lying. So it's right for the matter to be handled by Parliament because it's dealing with something that took place in the parliamentary context. Now we look at Mr Singh's case. The court report found Mr Singh to have played a key and leading role in advising Ms Khan not to come clean in Parliament and also called him the operating brain for her repeating the lie in Parliament on October the 4th. It also holds the view that Mr Singh lied on affirmation, which basically means lying under oath, and this may amount to perjury, which is a serious criminal offence. 
So it goes beyond just breaching privilege. And under the Parliament Privileges, Immunities and Powers Act, I mean, that's where we get a little bit technical here. Um, Parliament can refer a matter to the public prosecutor when an MP has committed 18 specific offences listed in Section 31, one of which is willfully making a false answer to a question, which of parliamentary privilege is not included in this list. In the case of Mr. Faisal, his repeated refusal to answer relevant questions could amount to an offence and be considered to be contempt of Parliament. So under Section 31 of the Act, it's an offence to refuse to answer any lawful or relevant question put by Parliament or any committee. So he's also being recommended to be referred to the public prosecutor. Um, overall, what we're looking at here is this. The COP has essentially recommended penalties, which it deems proportionate to the role played by each of the parties, and it has recommended them under the relevant sections of the law. In terms of next steps, the committee's report will be debated in Parliament next week and MPs will vote on it. So it's either Parliament deals with the matter or like what the committee recommends and like what you mentioned earlier as well, refers it to the public prosecutor. Uh, Grace, what are the different outcomes from these two routes? So when we talk about outcomes, we also need to talk about process. Right? So we start with the understanding that the COP can make recommendations but it's Parliament itself that has the power to impose sanctions. Um, it can also convene the COP again to look at the WP leader's conduct, um, similar to the process that Ms. Khan went through. But as the COP report pointed out, it's unlikely that convening another committee is going to move the needle very much, even though the first COP already produced so little documentation. The, the worst punishment that Parliament can meet out is jail or suspension right, for a term not exceeding the session of Parliament. But none of these sanctions in themselves will lead to someone losing his seat or being disqualified from standing for elections in the future. I mean, the worst case scenario is Parliament chooses to expel him. But we also have to bear in mind that the current Parliament is dominated by the PAP, the ruling party, and unilaterally expelling the leader of the opposition without the leader um, of the opposition having legal representation, because that's not part of the process here. Um, it's an extremely high signature move and it could inadvertently give weight to the argument among the WP's you know, strong supporters that maybe Parliament has already made up its mind. Now, under the public prosecutor route, you may actually have a more thorough investigation process because the public prosecutor can say direct the police to collect more evidence, to look through phone or email records, um, and after the investigations are complete, the public prosecutor then has to decide if the case is truly compelling enough to proceed with the charge. Now, if they are charged, then Mr. Singh and Mr. Faisal will go through a criminal trial and the courts will decide if they are guilty or not. They have the chance to defend themselves in court and be represented by legal counsel, right? which is what they don't have under the parliament uh, process. So the witnesses can be cross-examined, the evidence can be properly tested, and um, the punishments that they are subject to, which, which brings us to the outcomes that you were asking, depends on what offence they are charged with. Under Article 45 of the Constitution, if they are convicted of an offence in court and jail, um, uh, jailed for at least one year or fined at least $2,000, they will lose their seats and also be disqualified from standing as the MP for five years. If it is deemed that an offence is committed under Section 193 of the Penal Code, which deals with false evidence, then they can be jailed for up to three years and fined. What can we expect from the debate next week? Yeah, so the debate is expected to take place next Tuesday. Uh, Mr. Pradam Singh, Ms. Silverlin and Mr. Faisal will be expressing their views in a court report in Parliament um, and there'll be a debate. So a few things can happen from there. At the end of the debate, Parliament has to decide if it accepts the committee's findings and conclusions. It can choose to accept or reject the recommendations or it can amend those recommendations before taking them on. The matter will be put to a vote by the House and only a simple majority is needed. But, but I think we have to caution here that you know, we shouldn't prejudge the outcome. We we'll try to predict whether Mr. Singh will lose his seat because there is a long way to go. Um, and there hasn't been a case like this for a long time. The last time criminal charges were brought against an elected opposition MP uh, in relation to their political work was in the 1980s. And the situation is quite different then. So if Parliament chooses to go down the public prosecution route, uh, you also need a higher bar proof 
and it could be quite long and protracted. Um, trying to uncover evidence and cross-examine witnesses could take months, even years. But you're right in that there are existential issues at stake for the party because it strikes at the heart of its leadership. And there's also a lot at stake for the state of the opposition in Singapore, uh, including the size of its representation in Parliament. Grace, thank you for your perspectives. The Straits Times' opinion editor, Grace Hall.